of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Ms. Batiste, from the Carmelite Third Order. And tomorrow we will have the handmaids of Our Lady of Mount Carmel who will lead us in prayer in the morning. So we are right on time. So we're starting on time today, exactly at 1.30 p.m. Trinidad time. <laughs> so a special welcome to all of our international um, participants. And a very special but warm welcome to our presenter, Dr. Johan. So I now hand you over to Dr. Johan, whom you already know very well. Thank you. Thank you, Father Brent. And uh, good afternoon to you all. It's great to be with you again. I'm just going to share my screen. So um, yesterday, we had a very broad overlook at Mary in Carmel's history, skipping over eight centuries of our order's story in just an hour and a half. Um, and today, I propose that we look at Mary in Carmel's art and devotions. Um, again, this is a huge topic. and. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but I hope I can uh, maybe share something that will interest and inspire you. Um, I was just reflecting on the links that there are between England, where I am, and uh, the Caribbean, and hearing mention of uh, Mother Mary Ellica, who uh, took the name of Mary. You know, she was she was born in England as Claire Perrins and converted to. Catholicism and founded the Corpus Christi Carmelites going to, uh, to Trinidad. And so I'm asking for her prayers as, as we spend this time together, as well as those of Our Lady. So um, what I'd like to do is to look at some examples of Carmelite art and consider the brown scapular devotion. If you remember, I said yesterday, it's too big a topic to fit in yesterday, but I'll consider it today so that we can better understand and promote our order's heritage. I'd like to look at two historic icons in particular. The one on your screen isn't actually a historic icon. It's uh, from just a few years ago when the General Council of the Order um, commissioned this icon. It's called Our Lady of Hope, uh, Our Lady of the New Evangelization. And it's been traveling around the world uh, to encourage young people to know more about Carmel. And it's a, it's a very beautiful image. Uh, but I'd like to look at two historic icons and then look at the scapular's development. And again, I will throw out some questions for moments of reflection uh, for you to ponder individually, or maybe if you're part of a community uh, with other people. Now, I can't show you all the images of Mary and Carmelite art because I don't have them all. <laughs> I've got quite a good selection of photos. Um, but it would, it would take us weeks, and we haven't got weeks. But if any of you ever have the chance to go to Chicago in the United States, then I encourage you to make a visit to the city of Darien in Illinois, which is near Chicago, where the Carmelite Friars have the National Shrine of St. Teresa of Lisieux. And next to the National Shrine is a lovely museum where they have images of Our Lady of Mount Carmel from all around the world. Um, you can see on the screen uh, that quote I shared yesterday from St. Therese's Last Conversations, Mary is more mother than queen. And in these display cabinets, there are dozens, probably hundreds of images of Our Lady of Mount Carmel uh, from around the world. For example, these are from Portugal and Mexico. Traditional images of Our Lady wearing, you can see the the white cloak, the brown habit of the order with the crest, the baby Jesus has the scapular in his hands. That's a very typical uh, iconography of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And one of the beautiful things of the order and the church more generally is its ability to adapt uh, its 
customs, its devotions to the life and experience of local people. We call it enculturation, taking on cultural aspects of the place where the gospel has spread to. So we have here, for example, a Japanese statue of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. You can see she's got her scapula and she appears as a Japanese lady. Of course, we know that Our Lady Mary was a Jewish woman in first century Palestine. So she won't have looked uh, as, as this Japanese statue does, but that doesn't matter because we're not so worried about how Jesus or Mary looked it's about how we identify with them. And if we can use people's traditional Japanese dress, for example, as we have here, then it's easier for the people of Japan to identify with Our Lady. And we also have statues here from Korea and the Philippines. Also from Asia is this rather lovely image of Our Lady of Mount Carmel from uh, Thailand. You can see Our Lady is wearing a traditional Thai costume, as is the infant Jesus and the they're holding scapulars. So it's a blending of the iconography, the symbolism of Carmel with the local culture. From the USA, we have this very lovely icon of Our Lady Mount Carmel and traditional statues of her. And I particularly like this one from Africa, showing uh, Mary as uh, an African woman holding the baby Jesus. And we know it's Our Lady of Mount Carmel because she has this scapular over her arm, and I think it's a rather lovely, lovely image. So I invite you, before we go any further, just to stop and reflect for a moment. How has your mental image of Mary been formed? When you think of Mary, what sort of ideas and images come to mind? And how is Our Lady of Mount Carmel enculturated in your part of the world, whether you're in Trinidad or another of the islands in the West Indies or in the United States or the Netherlands or wherever you might be, how has the image of Our Lady been adapted to your local culture? Perhaps it doesn't seem particularly uh, adapted from the, the traditional European images. Maybe, maybe it has, I don't know. I'd be very interested to see any images that, that maybe you would like to send me. I'd be very interested to see. I should also say before going on, uh, I'm sorry that there's a lot of talking coming from me from this end. It's the only way it can be uh, with a Zoom conference. Normally, if I'm talking to a, a group, I would be a lot more interactive and be stopping and asking people questions and feedback. But obviously, we can't do that because of, of the circumstances. But I hope that I'll pause and give you opportunities for reflection. And if you do have questions, then do feel free to put them in the chat. And I propose to do as we did uh, yesterday to take a break after about 45 minutes uh, for five minutes refreshment or so and then to carry on and conclude with questions. So if you have any questions do do type them or save them for the end. So I've said I'd like to look at two icons. These are images that predate those images of Mary with the habit and the scapula and they may well be images that you're familiar with particularly this first one. It's known as La Bruna, which is Italian for the, the brown or dark one, the dark lady, because of Mary's complexion. You can see she's, she's got fairly uh, brown skin. And this is a 13th century icon that we find in the church, the basilica, known as the Carmine Maggiore, that's the, the Carmelite friary in Naples in Italy. It's right down by the docks in the historic center of Naples. Now legend says that this icon was brought from Mount Carmel to Naples. We just don't know. It's a nice thought that perhaps it did. And it's probably the best known icon in the, in the order. It's uh, right above the main altar, um, very beautifully displayed. And on the 16th of July, uh, the Feast of Our Lady Mount Carmel the whole city comes together in the square in front of the Carmelite Church. You can see this picture of fireworks going off from the belfry of the tower. They have um, processions and masses and prayers and a big party, which is the great thing about feasts celebrated um, in places like Italy and, and, and Spain. Here in England, we don't do things um, in such an elaborate and exciting way, which is a pity. Um, 
but if you want a place to go on the 16th of July for a party, then Naples would be a very good place. So what does this image of La Bruna say to us? Let's look at some of the iconography, some of the symbolism in this beautiful painting. It's in a style known as Eleusa. That's the term art historians give to it. And that means the Virgin of Tenderness. And I think it is a very tender, intimate image. You can see that Mary appears against this gold background. And in iconography, whenever you see gold, it denotes heaven and holiness. So we're in a divine space when we come before this icon. We are in the presence of God and of the holy. The mother and son both have golden halos, just in case we were in any doubt that it's uh, Christ and his mother. And Mary's cloak, you may notice, is, is a dark blue. And in iconography, blue is, of course, the colour of water, a symbol of fertility. And it reminds us that Mary has a divine motherhood. She is the, the mother of the Son of God. But she is still virgin, so the star on her cloak rep represents her virginity. Under her blue cloak is this red dress, and red can symbolise different things in different cultures and different styles of art. At this period, it normally symbolises love, and you can see that she's wrapping this red dress around the baby Jesus as a sign of her love for him. He himself is dressed in what seems to be lamb skin, which makes us think of him being the Lamb of God. And if you look at his face, the baby Jesus isn't really a newborn baby. Uh, he's a little older, perhaps suggesting the eternal existence of the word made flesh. Uh, this isn't a newborn baby. This is, if you like, a, an ageless or eternal uh, presence. Mary's left hand is holding Jesus safely to her, but the right hand is presenting him to us. It's almost holding him close and offering him forwards. And his hands are very interesting. Uh, he's holding his mother's chin, presenting her to us, or maybe turning her, uh, her face towards us. And the faces of mother and son are touching each other very gently. I don't know if you remember the year of mercy uh, that we celebrated a few years ago in the church. The official logo was a lovely icon style image of um, the father, the son, um, the good Samaritan. There was all sorts of symbolism there and, and joining eyes even, that the faces were so close to each other. And we have something a little similar here. Jesus is looking out at us, the viewer, whereas Mary is looking to the side, perhaps pondering her son's future. If any of you know the lovely icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help, Perpetual Succor, she's um, looking at us, whereas the son is looking off to the side as if foreseeing his passion. And all these elements invite us in. They invite us to an intimate familiarity with Mary and Jesus. Now, as well as being a beautiful image in its own right, La Bruna has a very interesting history. Um, it spread really after the year 1500. It was, as you can imagine, a holy year. Jubilee years are held normally every 25 years in the church, and uh, pilgrims go particularly to Rome in a holy year. And pilgrims took the icon of La Bruna from the Carmelite Friary in Naples to the Vatican where it was revered and processed back to Rome afterwards. So many people became devotees of the image that Our Lady um, was displayed, the icon was displayed um, in the square outside the Carmine Maggiore on the 24th of June. And it was a Wednesday. I'll explain in a minute why that is significant. And the King of Naples said that the sick ought to be brought um, and the icon processed around. 
and many people were healed and devotion therefore spread people kept coming particularly on Wednesdays and the icon was copied and spread to different houses of the order so to this day if you're ever in Naples go on a Wednesday because they have the devotion mass there they sing a litany they recite the seven joys of Mary there'll be some special sermon preached uh, catechesis and prayer and it's not only a day of prayer but also practical action uh, as I said, the Carmelite Friary is right by the docks at Naples. And Naples is just over the Mediterranean Sea from North Africa. And there's a long tradition of people traveling from North Africa as refugees, as asylum seekers, going to Naples, looking for work, looking for safety. And the Carmelite Order does amazing work at the Friary in Naples. They have doctors, they have um, lawyers, they have um, kitchens that feed hundreds of people every every day. But again, I think Wednesdays is a particularly special day. And so there's a, a mixing, if you like, of the, the devotion to Mary in prayer, coupled with very practical service of um, one's neighbour. So you just stop and look at this image for a minute and reflect. Does La Bruna appeal to you? Is it an image that draws you in? In recent years, it's become well known because of digital printing. Uh, for a while, uh, the, the devotion was, was shrunk uh, somewhat in Europe, but uh, since the 1970s and 80s, we've been able to print copies and send them out um, around the world again. And of course, you can find it online. So anyone today can get a copy of, of this image. The second icon I'd like to show you from our early history is uh, quite different and very interesting because it's only recently been restored and has helped us to uh, know a lot more about the early years of the Carmelites as we spread from Mount Carmel to Europe and beyond. The official title of this icon is the Enthroned Virgin of Mercy of the Carmelites. Bit of a mouthful. And it's on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. And it's made in a, a Latin, that's a Western style of icon, produ icon production with some Byzantine, that's Eastern features. Uh, so it's interesting that on Cyprus, the Carmelites seem to have been interacting with uh, both Catholic and Orthodox churches and, and Eastern and Western traditions. And it's big as far as icons go. It's, it's over two metres tall and a metre and a half wide, which suggests it would have originally been an altarpiece up against uh, an altar, above an altar, um, probably from... Well, certainly from the Carmelite Church in Cyprus, and it's now in the Makarios III Byzantine Museum in Nicosia, the capital of Cyprus. It's painted onto wooden panels, and this is how the image looked until recently. Before it was restored in 2012, you can see um, much darker um, chipped and in need of cleaning because over the centuries, particularly uh, icons that have been in churches, they get soot from candles and all that kind of thing gradually um, covers the surface and it was in desperate need of repair. And thanks to modern techniques with x-rays and all sorts of things, um, art historians and scientists were able to restore it to this you can see it's a, a much brighter, uh, simpler image. Now, apart from the obvious brightness, I wonder if you can spot a very interesting difference. And I'll give you a clue. If you look at these figures of Carmelites kneeling here and compare it with the Carmelites kneeling here, you'll see that these Carmelites have 
white cloaks, whereas these Carmelites have stripy cloaks. So when the art historians stripped away paint that had been put on top of the original icon, because that tends to be what happens when there's um, a change in fashion or a bit of paint peels off, someone comes along and puts a bit more paint on top. But they wanted to get back to the original, the very earliest version of it. So they, they took off the paint that had been put on top of the original icon. And they discovered that the Carmelites depicted didn't have white cloaks. They had these brown and white striped cloaks. Now we know from uh, the early texts of the order that this was a change that happened in 1287. There was a general chapter of the brothers in Montpellier in France, and they resolved that they were going to swap stripy cloaks for plain white cloaks. There's all sorts of reasons why that I won't go into now. But that helps us to date this icon. We know that um, this depiction is almost certainly made before 1287. So it's at a time when the Carmelites were leaving Mount Carmel. We know that they came to Cyprus first. Eventually they had five foundations in Cyprus. And so this icon is created, was created during the Crusades as the order was um, moving into Europe. So it's really a very early, uh, very early image of Our Lady as revered by Carmelites. As you can imagine, with this sort of icon, there's all kinds of symbolism and iconography, and I will take you through some of it. So if you look at the central panel, this, this central panel here, where Mary and the infant Jesus are, it's three times bigger than these side panels. So our attention is drawn very strongly to the central figures of Mary and Jesus. And they're sat within what we call a trilobate arch in art historical terms. And again, it's to frame the figures and to suggest that we're entering into this holy space, which you can see from all the gold that is here. And Mary is depicted in a Byzantine style called the Theotokos Kyriotisa, Kyriotisa, which means the Holy Mother of God enthroned because she's sat on a wooden throne with a high red backrest. And she's wearing red shoes on a red footstool. And whereas the Labruna image is using a, a Western style where red symbolizes love, in Byzantine iconography, it particularly is used to express joy and festivity, thanksgiving. So this is a, a very happy image. It's saying, we've got something to celebrate. We've got someone to celebrate and it's Our Lady. And she's got beautiful, big almond shaped eyes, often a symbol of compassion and a very small mouth, perhaps reflecting her silent uh, role in many parts of the Gospels, pondering, thinking, reflecting on uh, the word of God in her life. And if we look at the figure of the baby Jesus, he's seated on Mary's arm, so she is a throne for him, as well as having her own throne. And his arm, as often in iconography, is out protecting his mother, and his hand is resting over her heart, a symbol of his being flesh of her flesh. And he's blessing. And again, the artist has chosen this time a, a Western style, Latin, because he's using two fingers and thumb. Uh, that's how blessings were done in the Catholic tradition rather than the Orthodox. Both mother and son have crowns. If you recall yesterday, I talked about Jesus and Mary being the Lord of the place and lady of the place. So here we have that image of them as regal uh, feudal figures. And above them, we have the archangels, Michael and Gabriel, the vanquisher of Satan and the herald of the incarnation. And they are sensing, they are um, wafting incense over our lady. It's interesting if you zoom in and look at the Carmelites who are down um, sheltering under Our Lady's cloak. You can see she's got her cloak here spread out around them. In Eastern 
iconography that's called a escape or shelter. In Western art, it's often known as the Virgin of Mercy, the one who enfolds us in her mercy and protection. And there are 10 Carmelite brothers um, at this stage. They're sort of in between being hermits and friars. Um, but we know that nine of them are religious because they've got tonsures. That is, they've got bald tops of the head. I just have a bald top of my head because I'm balding. But these guys have deliberately cut off the hair at the top of their head as a sign of their religious profession. But one of them doesn't. This chap just here doesn't have a tonsure. He has a full head of hair. So who's he? He might be a lay associate. Um, the third order as such didn't exist, but we know that lay people have always been drawn to um, the spirituality of Carmel. And indeed, probably the very first hermits on Carmel were, uh, the vast majority of them would have been lay people, not priests. Um, it may be that this figure is the donor who's paid to have this icon made, or it may even be the, the painter, the writer himself. And all their faces are pretty similar. Um, fleshy with bulging eyes and stark expression, um, which isn't how most Carmelite friars look today. Then you've got these side panels, these lateral panels, and they depict 16 miracle scenes of the mercy of the Virgin. And they've got Latin inscriptions. Some of them have worn away, but we have most of them. And they indicate what's being shown in each of these scenes. And by looking at the inscriptions and trying to see what's in the pictures, we can reconstruct um, what works of mercy, what miracles Mary is um, reputed to have performed for the Carmelites in Cyprus. It's probable that um, a lot of religious houses, they had books of miracles or, or some sort of record of um, special events that had been attributed to Our Lady. And we don't have that surviving, but this would seem to be a visual representation of some of those miracles. And it's interesting that almost all the scenes that are depicted show a community gathering together, not just single people. And I'll just rattle through them because they're quite interesting. We don't really know much about the background, but the first image seems to show fundraising for the first Carmelite church on Cyprus, um, the, the brothers begging for arms. Um, Carmelites were always asking for money for things. Um, and we have a long tradition for that. Then there's an image showing soldiers standing in front of the closed doors of the Carmelite church, which maybe only makes sense when you look at the next one because the inscription says the doors open miraculously Mary appears, I'm sorry that you can't see in great detail, but the figure of Mary is there as the Carmelites are saying mass. So it's almost, this is just a guess, we don't know, um, that maybe the doors of the, the, the community, the, the, the friary, priory, closed in protection of uh, the Carmelites inside and they couldn't be opened. Maybe because of attacks that were going on uh, we know in Mount Carmel, we know that Cyprus was invaded at different times by different forces. And it's only when the Carmelites say mass that Our Lady appears and opens the door um, because they're now safe. We're not sure. That's one interpretation. You then get uh, in the next scene a group of disabled people and lepers who are miraculously healed by the Virgin. And a group of blind people and even a group of dead people who've been brought back to life through Our Lady's intercession. Then there's a scene where people who are in jail are liberated thanks to Our Lady. And then a group of people who are demoniacs that have been possessed by the devil uh, and Our Lady heals them. So no wonder with all these miracles that this is a happy image, a Thanksgiving image. On the right hand side, we have a continuation of these stories. Uh, Our Lady healing a group of men uh, this one looks like they might be suffering from, from what used to be called dropsy. Here the Virgin is interceding to rescue pilgrims and prisoners from peril at sea. Then she appears on top of a pear tree to a group of people. 
Um, now, interestingly, there's a story that we know of over 100 years later, uh, written by a Carmelite about a conversion. Um, someone who's converted to Christianity when he sees Our Lady appear in a pear tree. This would, if that's what this is referring to, then that story must be much older than we thought. The Virgin heals um, the cut hand of a Carmelite. She rescues a man trapped under a millstone. She grants children to infertile women and saves a child from drowning. And then perhaps most remarkably of all, a child born without a head receives one, thanks to the Virgin's intercession. Very, very interesting icon uh, and needs a lot more study to be done on it. So two very important early images of Mary, La Bruna and uh, this icon from Cyprus. And I invite you to just stop and reflect for a minute. If you were commissioning or making an artwork of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, what would you want it to say? What symbols or events might you include? Would they be miracles or something else? Uh, I think it'd be quite interesting to, to think, what would we put into a modern day artwork of Our Lady? That's all I'm going to say on the art of uh, Mary in the Carmelite tradition. There's so much more that could be said, but I just wanted to share those two early images with you because they're a bit more unusual perhaps than the ones that we, we see more familiarly. And for the rest of uh, our time, I'd like to consider another symbol, another artistic, if you like, uh, item, very much connected with Our Lady Mount Carmel, and that's the Carmelite brown scapula. As I said yesterday, it's, it's too big a topic to have fitted in yesterday. Um, it's a very interesting topic. It's uh, something of a controversial topic, and I hope that what I'm going to say isn't going to offend or upset anyone. Um, I hope that you'll find the historical story quite fascinating of how we have the scapular devotion today. Um, so here we go. What are we going to consider? Well, we'll look at what the scapular is. I assume that most of you know, but uh, just in case you don't, I'll share a little bit about that. What does it symbolise? What are its origins? Let's then look a little more broadly at the significance of clothing, socially and spiritually. Then we touch on the contentious bit, the scapular vision legend and the Sabatine privilege. I'll explain what those are when we get to it. And we'll finish by asking what place does the scapular devotion have in the church and in Carmel today? So if you have a pen and paper to hand, you might like to just jot down five words that you associate with the Carmelite scapular devotion. Five words. As you do that, I will introduce the brown scapula, which is simply a piece of cloth worn over the shoulders, as we see uh, Carisha here wearing, as an item of popular devotion. It's what we call in the church a sacramental, that is a material object that's been blessed to show loving respect towards God and encourage greater devotion to God, particularly in the sacraments. Catholics and many other Christians believe that material objects can, if correctly used, lead us into a closer relationship with God. And I say if correctly used because sometimes we can turn an icon into an idol. And it's when we think that the material object is what we're actually worshipping rather than the the God it reminds us of, that's when it becomes a problem. The brown scapula is part of a hugely popular devotion. Hundreds of thousands of people, I reckon probably millions around the world, wear the Carmelite brown scapula, but it's probably not very well understood. Um, and this is a good time to, I think, reclaim it, explain it, celebrate it, um, because we're having something of a revival of popular devotion in the church. And Pope Francis has been very strong in saying things like the rosary, stations of the cross, processions in honour of Mary, the scapula, these things can be very helpful to us. They were sort of rejected after the Second Vatican Council, but actually they have some value. Now I need to explain what these pictures are, because 
Uh, I showed them at a talk once and someone got very upset because they saw these hooded, uh, hooded figures with these pointy hats, these pointy hoods, and they thought that they were the American KKK, you know, the racist uh, organization in North America. It's most definitely not that. These are photos from Spain. And this is a procession in Malaga uh, where the tradition is to cover your face with a hood as a sign of humility. So everyone is equal in this procession. It doesn't matter if you're the mayor or a celebrity or the very poorest person in town, everyone dresses the same and you can't see who they are because they wear these hoods. And over their shoulders, they wear the scapular. Now this happens to be blue in color to match their hoods, but you can see the Carmelite crest in brown at the center. And some people have said, oh, if, if groups like the KKK have appropriated this religious imagery, should we just get rid of it? It's been tainted. Um, that's certainly one argument. Another is to say, no, we need to reclaim it and say this is ours. It, it's been hijacked by the bigots, and the racists, and they have no right to it. So something to think about. So what does the scapula symbolize? Traditionally, it's been a symbol of the wearer being clothed as a follower of Mary and therefore of her son, Jesus. It's a symbol of belonging to the Carmelite family because it's a miniature version of the habit of Mary's order. It's a sign of dedication to serving God and building up God's kingdom and a sign of protection from temptation and from punishment due for sin after death. Those are the traditional interpretations of the main symbolic values of the scapula. So let's just unpack those a little more deeply. It's a symbol of Marian protection. Here again, we have this image of the Virgin of Mercy wrapping her mantle, her cloak, around Carmelites who are holding on to her scapula here. It's a physical sign of the protection we believe that Mary, Mother of God, gives to us, her children. Do you remember in the Labruna icon how she was wrapping her son Jesus in her own her own dress, her own clothing. It's that sense of being wrapped in the love of Mary. As a mother comes, uh, as a mother closes, clothes a child, so Mary, our mother and sister, clothes us with her loving care. As well as being a symbol of Marian protection, the scapula is a symbol of Carmelite belonging because it's a miniature version of the habit, a sign of belonging to the Carmelite family and identifying with the order's values. So this is a scene from the Carmelite Priory at Aylesford in the south of England, and these gentlemen are being enrolled in the, in the Carmelite scapula uh, by Father Francis here, and this is uh, Father Jed talking about the scapula devotion. So it's very much our family uniform, if you like. It's also a symbol of service, because essentially it comes from the religious habit, and it's the apron that protects the tunic. If I'm going to cook a meal or paint or do something um, that might involve getting splashed with um, food or chemicals or whatever, I'll put an apron on or some protective clothing. And originally that's what the scapula was for on the habit. It's an apron to stop the tunic getting dirty when working. So it's also therefore a symbol of service, which I've represented with this stained glass image of a friar who's preparing a, um, perhaps a meal or some kind of medicine. This is from a Carmelite church in, uh, in Germany. And his scapula is stopping uh, his clothes from, from getting spoiled. And the scapula, as I said, is a symbol of salvation. It's traditionally been linked to the idea of being saved from purgatory after death. Uh, this is a, an image from a stained glass window in Spain here is Our Lady and the infant Jesus with these poor souls in purgatory um, calling out to her for uh, salvation. Now that's a symbolic ele element that frightens some people uh, and it does need some careful explanation today and we're, we're going to look at it more deeply later. So just stop and reflect for a minute. Which of these symbolic values of the scapula means the most to you? Is it the Marian protection? 
Is it the sense of Carmelite belonging? Is it the pledge of salvation? Or is it the symbol of service? Of course, it's all those, but does one of those speak to you particularly? Or is it some other symbol, uh, some other value that you take from the scapula? This image here is of the scapula worn by St. Oscar Romero, uh, who, as you probably know, was martyred, shot dead while celebrating mass in a Carmelite chapel in El Salvador. Uh, he lived alongside the Carmelite sisters in San Salvador, the capital where he was archbishop. And because of his outspoken defense of the poor, uh, he was targeted and, and shot, uh, recently canonized. And this is the scapula he was wearing when he died. So what are the origins of this scapula? As I said, uh, it's part of the religious habit originally, the clothing worn by religious monks, friars, nuns, and it comes from the Latin word scapula, meaning shoulder, because it's a large cloth that goes over the shoulders like an apron over the religious habit. And each religious order has its own style of habit, its own uniform, if you like, which helps us to recognize whether someone is this order or that order. Now, traditionally, the symbol of belonging to Carmel wasn't the scapula, it's the white cloak. We've already seen the significance of the cloak in the icon in Cyprus. Um, the white cloak, which we heard yesterday, is reminiscent of Mary's purity as well as Christ's transfiguration and resurrection, and a reminder of our own baptismal gown. So here are Carmelite friars, sisters, both OCAM and OCD, ancient branch and discalced, um, all wearing white cloaks. Medieval monks and friars showed their religious profession through the tonsure, that cutting of the hair that I talked about earlier. And the habit was really meant to just be the everyday dress of, of the people, nothing too fancy, but, but showing poverty in a simple life. And there's a debate that still goes on in the church today as to whether members of religious orders should wear something distinctive or whether they should wear the common clothes of the day. And some say it depends on what you're doing. So these are photos of my friend, Father Kevin. Here he is in his Carmelite habit. Here he is in jeans and a shirt, giving a talk to university students. And here he is officiating as a priest at a wedding. What do you think? I don't think there's a simple answer. Um, what did Jesus say about religious clothing? I think he does mention it with reference to the religious leaders of his time, and he's not very complimentary. But what do you think? Are there value, is there value in being able to identify someone's religious belief from their clothing? Now, it's not just the church that has uniforms, if you like. In medieval Europe, there were laws about what people could and couldn't wear, depending on your social class. And we talked yesterday about the feudal system, the lords and the ladies and the servants who worked uh, for them. And you showed your allegiance to a particular lord or lady by wearing their colours. Here we have a, a picture of someone being clothed in uh, the appropriate colours of, of their lord. You can see these various different colours here. And so religious in the Middle Ages also wore clothes that expressed something about their spiritual allegiance. And it wasn't just religious. As lay people were attracted to different religious orders and wanted to share something of their spirituality, um, those orders extended the symbolism to them. But they didn't give them full habits, they gave them reduced or miniature versions in the form of the, the small, the miniature scapula that we're familiar with. So um, this is a picture showing just some of the range of different scapulas that exist. Um, the Passionists and the Servites have a black scapula, the Trinitarians a white scapula, the Theatines a blue scapula, and so on. The Carmelites, obviously, we have our brown scapula, but there are many scapulas across different religious orders. And they are all symbols of the values of those orders. Now, some of the earliest lay people that we know associated with the, the Carmelite friars in the Middle Ages um, some of you will have heard of 
a, a bull called Cumnulla, which the Pope issued in 1452, recognizing groups of lay people associated with the order for the first time. And in that text, there's a reference to the Mantellati. And if you think of, of the first letters there, mantle, the Mantellati are the cloak wearers. So groups of men and women who were not friars, but lay people who wore the white cloak. They were forerunners of our third order and professed to follow the, the Carmelite way of life as lay people. Uh, these are photos of lay people here in this central picture that I took at the last international gathering of lay Carmelites in Rome in 2018. You can see they're wearing veils, they're wearing the white cloak, they're wearing a form of habit, but they are not actually friars or nuns, they're lay people. And this is a photo um, from a visit I made in 2017 to uh, the Carmelites in Vietnam. And there, their symbol of belonging for one particular group is t-shirts, brown t-shirts with white writing that says, keep calm, I'm a Carmelite forever, which I think is rather nice. Um, so maybe that will be uh, a future symbol of Carmelite identity. Today, in some countries, members of the Third Order still wear a white cloak. Um, others wear a reduced version of the scapula, um, such as what this gentleman's wearing, um, depending on what stage of religious profession they might be at. And in some countries, for example, here in the Philippines, they still wear the white cloak. And as well as those Third Order scapulas, we have the miniature scapulas where people are enrolled into what we call the Carmelite scapular confraternity, a brotherhood or sisterhood of scapular wearers, people who identify with the values of Carmel. And scapulars can come in many different forms. These are just some that I've seen over the years, uh, made of metal and wood and, and plastic. Um, they're not always immediately obvious as, as scapulars, but they are scapulars in different forms. And in 1910, Pope uh, St. Pius X said that it was possible uh, once you've been enrolled in the, the cloth scapula, because it has all that symbolic va uh, value of being clothed, you could then substitute it with a, um, a medal, uh, which may be more practical for some people. Some people, has to be said, are a bit superstitious about their scapulars, never taking them off. Um, I find that it can get a bit sweaty and uncomfortable and needs to be changed in the place now and then. Um, anyway, such things are, are up to the individual, really. But again, to put this devotion in context, I think we need to look at the, the broader issue of the symbolism of clothing, because on social and religious levels, clothes have symbolic value whether you're wearing your national dress or um, traditional, here we have the, the Queen of England and, and judges at the opening of parliament, Buddhist monks. Um, the way we dress says something about our identity, our values. Um, and in every culture, both nakedness and clothing are closely linked to ideas like power, innocence and so on. Uh, now this slide normally wakes people up. We're all born naked and for some people being naked is what feels most natural. I didn't know but there is such a thing as the Catholic Naturist Association and here they are having mass. Aside from nakedness, clothing says something about what we stand for. And you might wear clothes for a practical or symbolic purpose. So here we have different police officer uh, outfits and we associate certain values with certain uniforms. If we see someone wearing a uniform like this, we expect them to be law abiding. Uh, if we see someone wearing a surgical outfit, perhaps with a stethoscope and a, and a surgical mask, well, we're all wearing those at the moment, um, but we'd think, ah, oh, here's someone who believes in healing and in medicine. Uh, if we see someone wearing 
a dog collar or a religious habit, we think, aha, he is a Christian. So what we wear says a lot about our role and our beliefs. And in the Bible, that symbolism of clothing comes across again and again. Um, this image here is from the Carmelite Church in Florence in Italy, and it depicts the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And you remember that the first thing they did after the fall, after eating the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, uh, was to cover themselves up because they were ashamed of their nakedness. And throughout the scriptures, we find the idea of clothing very uh, potent as, uh, as a metaphor. So justice demands that the naked be clothed. And of course, uh, clothing the naked is one of the things that Jesus uh, demands of us in Matthew 25. People touch Jesus's garments for healing. Jesus said to give your cloak as well to the one who asks for your coat. At the crucifixion, he was stripped of his garments. St. Paul describes being clothed in Christ in his letter to the Galatians. And in the book of Revelation, the redeemed wear robes that have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. And for Carmelites, of course, we take particular interest in the clothing of our spiritual father, Elijah, who wrapped his cloak around Elisha, his follower, as a sign of calling him to be his disciple. And when Elijah rose to paradise in the fiery chariot, he cast his cloak down to Elisha, passing on his authority as a prophet. Uh, and Elisha then uses that uh, cloak to, he touches the water of the river, the waters part, and uh, miraculously he, he makes his way through. And the idea of clothing, inspires St Paul in his letter to the Ephesians when he's talking about spiritual armour, which gets quoted extensively in our rule of St Albert. So the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. These are very important uh, concepts and metaphors. How on earth did the Carmelite scapula become such a popular devotion? Well, I'm going to leave you hanging with that question because I think we deserve a little uh, break and it's now uh, about 22 minutes past so I'm going to pause for just five minutes uh, for you to have a comfort break and uh, if anyone has any questions they want to ask in the interim please do feel free but I'll briefly stop uh, sharing the screen and we'll gather back in five minutes. For those who are just joining us uh, in the Zoom chat, we're just having a brief pause uh, for a comfort break before the second half of the, the presentation.
I'll be back in just a minute. So I hope uh, you've managed to get a, a bit of fresh air or a comfort break. And I left you with a question hanging. How did the Carmelite scapula become such a popular devotion? And it's really all down to the legend of the scapular vision. It's inextricably uh, linked to Our Lady, of course, and Simon Stock. Uh, an early Carmelite friar. And this is where things get a bit contentious <laughs> because many of us grew up hearing the story of the scapular vision and uh, there are many strongly held beliefs about it. But you remember I was talking yesterday about uh, the encouragement of the church in recent decades, recent centuries really, to um, be rigorous in our historical study and in our understanding. And we've learned a lot about the development of the scapular vision as, uh, as a devotion. And I'll share with you some of that. So a popular legend says that the Virgin Mary gave the scapular to Simon Stock in a vision in 1251. Some say it was on the 16th of July, 1251, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I'll talk about the feast tomorrow and how they got the date wrong with regard to this. But anyway, according to this popular legend, um, Mary promised that whoever wears the scapula will be released from purgatory on the first Saturday after death. Now, historians and the official church have seriously questioned the factual basis of this popular legend, but the idea is still very widespread and fraught with historical and theological problems. So how did the legend of the scapular vision come about? And if it isn't historically true, and I'll leave it up to you to decide if you think it's true or not, how can we promote the scapular authentically and meaningfully today? So what are the facts? What do we know? Well, we know that 
there really was a man called Simon Stock. He did exist. Very good evidence for that. He was the prior general, the most senior brother of the order, elected in the 1250s. And because he was so early in the order's history, it's very likely that he had been uh, one of the hermits on Mount Carmel, who had probably come from England and returned to England, um, having been a hermit on Carmel. His name suggests that he might have come from a place called Stockbury, which is near the historic Carmelite Priory of Aylesford, which many of you will have heard of, uh, a place associated with him in later legends. And Aylesford's important because it's where the first general chapter of the order took place in 1247. And stock is an old English word for a tree trunk. So some legends, and this piece of art here, um, depicts him living as a hermit in a tree trunk, an empty, an empty tree trunk. Now we know that Simon Stock, the prime general, died in 1265, either visiting blood relatives or fellow Carmelites, because the records say he was visiting his brothers in the French town of Bordeaux. We don't know if they were his blood brothers or, or Carmelite brothers. He died with a reputation for holiness to the extent that he was buried in the cathedral and devotion arose there uh, soon after his death. And he was revered in Bordeaux, uh, here in the cathedral, beautiful building, throughout the 14th century. But there's no record of Simon Stock, the pious prior general from England, ever having received a vision of Our Lady with the scapula in those early decades, those early centuries, uh, when he was being revered as a holy man in Bordeaux. Now, towards the end of the 14th century, the late 1300s, a catalogue of Carmelite saints appeared, uh, a text that, that listed the saints of the order. And this was in the, the Low Countries, Flanders, the Netherlands, and it promoted the holiness of early Carmelite hermits and friars. And as this uh, catalogue, the catalogue is spread from Carmelite house to Carmelite house, printing presses hadn't been invented quite yet. It was still scribes copying down everything by hand. And as they copied, they would add things in that they knew about. And then a copy would be passed to the next priory and they would probably add something in. So by dating these different copies of the catalogus, we know that around the year 1400, this entry was added. Saint Simon was an Englishman of great holiness and devotion, who always begged the Virgin in his prayers that she would bestow some special privilege on his order. To him, the Virgin appeared carrying a scapula in her hands and said, let this be a pledge to you and to your brethren. Whoever dies wearing it shall be saved. Okay. Now, stories of saintly interventions from Our Lady in favour of, of, of a religious order were quite common in the Middle Ages. It wasn't just the Carmelites who had them. It seems to have been a common thing that orders um, experienced or invented um, to show that they had a special place in the church and uh, some people felt that it was necessary to associate yourself with the religious order in order to, to attain salvation. Um, that's why you get around a lot of the medieval friaries, a lot of lay burials. People wanted to be really close to the, to the church. But several orders had um, vision stories in which Our Lady promised something special, often associated with the habit. The Cistercians have a story, the Primos Detentions, the Dominicans, the Servites, the Augustinians, the Franciscans, they all have versions of, um, if not a scapular vision, then, then something very similar. Now, I don't know if you noticed that that text I showed you from the Catalogus around the year 1400 simply referred to a holy English Carmelite called Simon. Now, he doesn't seem to be the same person as Simon Stock, the Englishman buried in Bordeaux. The historian Father Richard Copsey has pointed out that that entry that was added to the catalogue doesn't mention the surname of Stock, it just says Saint Simon. It doesn't mention he was prior general, which would be a pretty major thing to mention in a, a Carmelite record. And it doesn't say that he was buried in Bordeaux. 
Now, those are all important things that you would expect someone to record. So Father Richard, and I think he's right, argues that there are two different Simons being talked about. There's Simon Stock, prior general buried in Bordeaux, and Saint Simon the Englishman, who had a vision of some description recorded in the 1400s. So in 1423, the prior of Ghent in the Low Countries, he wanted some relics of Simon Stock for his church. And so he wrote to the order in Bordeaux and asked for them to send some relics from the cathedral. And the letter from Bordeaux talks about Simon Stock's holy life, but, it, but makes no mention of a vision or a scapular vision. So in the 1400s, there are two different Simons. Simon Stock, the English prior general, and Simon, also English, who's a visionary. And they become conflated into one person, one story. So people began saying that Simon, the Englishman who had a vision of Mary giving him the scapula, oh, that must be the same person as Simon Stock, the prior general who's buried in Bordeaux, because they're both called Simon and they're both from England. It seems natural to us that you would say they're the same person, but clearly the, the, the records show that they're, they're not. And as happens, particularly in the Middle Ages, they had a different concept of, of truth. And what mattered to them often was the bigger spiritual truth, not the literal historical truth. And the entries in this catalog of Carmelite saints about Simon Stock began to be more and more fanciful. So originally he was described as, as prior general for 50 years. Some scribe writing later says, oh, let's make it 100. He was prior general for 100 years. I don't think we've ever had a prior general for 100 years. I think they'd have resigned before they uh, had been in office for 100 years. But these stories get more and more elaborate as, you know, what it's like. Uh, I guess you may have the same phrase as, as we have in England of Chinese whispers. You whisper one thing and, and the story gets changed and elaborated as it goes along. And so by the time you get to 1500, the Carmelite prior in Bordeaux, where Simon Stock, the prior general, has been buried, he writes a life of Saint Simon Stock, which now includes a scapular vision and other legendary stories that he's heard about or possibly just made up. Now we can say that the legend goes viral, to use a modern term. More and more lay people started to wear the scapula because of this claim that's now in the Catalogus legend saying, whoever dies it, uh, uh, whoever dies wearing the scapula will be saved. And everyone wants to be certain of salvation, don't they? We all want to, to be saved. Well, actually we've been saved by uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. No matter how many scapulars you wear, it's not the scapula that does it. But anyway, people want as much reassurance as possible. And so the Carmelite scapula became hugely popular across Europe. And Carmelite friaries established confraternities, brotherhoods, sisterhoods of scapular wearers. They'd come together for prayer and for good works. By the early 1600s, the confraternity that met at the Carmelite Church of San Martino in Rome, it had 30,000 people. Uh, these are members of the scapular confraternity at Traspontina Church in Rome. Again, you can see they're, they're not friars, but they're wearing something similar to the friars and they're they're wearing scapulars. In Lisbon in the 1700s, there were tens of thousands of people in the scapular confraternity. It became very, very popular. And as sometimes happens with popular things, the legend became even more elaborate. Another strand got woven into this legendary story. It was said um, in the 15th century that a papal letter was discovered. Um, now, this is the 1400s, they're saying, oh, we've just discovered this document from 100 years ago, apparently dated 1322. And it seems to be written by Pope John the 22nd. And this letter uh, was given the nickname the Bulla Sabatina, or Sabatine Bull, because it's, 
it takes that name from the Latin for Saturday, Sabatum in, in Latin, which is already widely known by this stage as a day of special Marian benevolence. Many devotions to Mary take place in the church on a Saturday. And in this alleged letter, bull of Pope, uh, Pope John, it says that the Virgin Mary appeared to him saying that whoever wore the Carmelite habit would be released from purgatory the first Saturday after death. So not only do we have a legend that uh, a Carmelite was told that if you wear this, you'll um, be saved uh, for eternal life, but a Pope has said it'll happen the first Saturday after you die. Now, this was known as the Sabatine privilege, this reputed pledge of Mary to release on Saturday souls in purgatory who'd worn the Carmelite scapula. And it made the scapula more popular than ever. Again, this was linked by various people saying, oh, here we've got the story of Simon Stock, here we've got the story of the scapula, here we've got the bull of John the 22nd. They all get wrapped up. Now, the church was skeptical of a lot of these legends. And in 1631, the Vatican gave the scapular devotion official approval, but said that it was doubtful about this reputed vision of uh, Pope John. And so the Holy See instructed our order to drop references to this Sabatine bull, which it sadly, often we failed to do that. We just carried on anyway, <laughs> because people liked hearing it. Um, but since 1631, we've supposed not to talk about the Sabatine privilege. The order spread this devotion, not only in its writings and its preaching, but also in art. This is um, another early icon of the order from the 15th century that depicts miracles attributed to, to Mary and the scapula, similar to the Cyprus icon we saw earlier. And it's around this alleged vision to um, Pope John and how Mary would carry souls from purgatory on Saturdays. However, in the 1960s, a Carmelite historian called Father Lukavico Saggi, he established very convincingly that this Sabatine bull, this supposed letter of the Pope, was a fake, almost certainly concocted by Italian Carmelites around the year 1430. Um, not actually a letter written by the Pope a hundred years earlier. And in that same decade, the 60s, the Second Vatican Council said, we need to um, drop, modify, reform devotions that are founded on, on legend, on superstition, because our faith really should be more firmly rooted in pondering the scriptures, celebrating the sacraments, studying the church's tradition. Now, where does that leave devotion to Our Lady of Mount Carmel? Because so many people associate Our Lady of Mount Carmel with the scapula. Another changing attitude uh, in the last hundred years is, is about purgatory. It used to be seen as, as, as this, souls writhing in, in fire, a sort of temporary hell. Whereas, particularly in the last hundred years, there's been quite a, a shift amongst many Christians, even amongst Protestant Christians who initially rejected the idea of purgatory to say, maybe purgatory isn't a place of punishment. Maybe it's a place of healing and being made whole. Some of you will be familiar with the writer C.S. Lewis, who, uh, who wrote the, the Narnia books, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and so on. And he describes purgatory as getting ready for the best party you're ever going to go to, which is, which is heaven, to be with God forever. And you want to look your best for the party and you take your time to get ready. You wouldn't rush the process. You need that time to wash, to dress, to, to get prepared. And maybe purgatory is more like that rather than punishment. There's also the question of time in purgatory, because the Sabatine privilege, which we now know was a fake, and we've been told we shouldn't be talking about, said that 
uh, souls would be released on the first Saturday after death. How can there be a Saturday in a space outside of human time? Saturdays are a, are a human way of thinking of time. Purgatory is part of God's eternal process. How can you have a Saturday? So it's up to you to think. Do you believe in purgatory? What sort of purgatory do you think exists? Um, and does this tradition of the scapula fit into that? So to summarize, because it is quite a complicated mixture of things, Simon Stock really did exist. He was an Englishman, an early prior general of the Carmelites, and after his death and burial in Bordeaux, he attained a reputation for holiness. I have no problem saying, St. Simon Stock, pray for us. We know he existed. Accounts emerged around 1400 of another holy Carmelite from England called Simon, who apparently received a vision of the Virgin Mary giving him a scapula and promising salvation. We know that such accounts were common in medieval Europe. This visionary Simon and Simon Stock, the prior general, were gradually identified as one and the same person, but only in accounts written 200 years after the supposed scapular vision. Then a fake papal letter recounting another vision of Our Lady, this one to Pope John XXII, promised that Mary would save from purgatory anyone wearing the Carmelite habit or scapula on the first Saturday after they died. And all these stories become blended together with an existing Carmelite devotion to Our Lady and the practice of lay Carmelites and uh, lay friends of the order wearing a miniature version of the habit. That's essentially uh, how the scapular legend came to be. Now, does this mean that we can't take some benefit from the scapular devotion? Absolutely not. I think there is a truth or truths that we can take from the scapula. Does it still have something to say to us? Absolutely it does. It still has value, even if we don't believe in a vision and if we don't believe in the Sabatine ball. We can still wear the scapula and promote the scapula to express our trust in good faith that Mary will assist the members of the Carmelite family, both living and dead, who clothed in the order's habit have lived in the light of God's grace, sharing the good news and the spirituality of Carmel. Now, maybe what I've said has been upsetting to you because when we hear that something we've grown up with as a long-standing tradition may not be true, that can, that can be unsettling. It's up to you to decide whether or not you think Our Lady ever appeared to St. Simon Stock. You can't disprove the scapular vision legend, but I hope I've shown you that there's a lot of historical evidence to show how such a legend arose. And not believing in a scapular vision or the Sabbatine privilege doesn't stop us from believing in the holiness of Simon Stock and the symbolic value of the scapula that I talked about at the beginning, the protection, the uh, closeness of Carmelite values, the service. And I worry that if we cling to the legend in the face of all the evidence against it, it, it undermines our credibility. People just laugh at us and say, well, it's, it's, it's clearly not true. Why would you say it? So I invite you to reflect. What do you believe? And it's worth bearing in mind that even though a legend is not factually true, scientifically true, they can still teach us truth. Throughout human history and every culture, people have told myths and legends. They were never meant to be believed as historically accurate, but they contain and convey a message with profound truths. So the Bible has several stories that the Jewish people told one another that they never really believed happened, but which say something in a, in a parable form, in a metaphorical form, about humanity's understanding of God. And I would say, for me, the scapular legend is historically very dubious, but it tells us those important truths. Mary does 
care for us like a mother. God does want all people to be saved and belonging to a religious family like Carmel can help us in following Jesus and living the gospel. Those are the truths of the scapular legend. And it's still a very important devotion for Carmelites, and I think should be. Uh, we've got pictures here. This is the, the scapular shrine. It's called the Dalesford Priory. Um, and a statue of Our Lady Mount Carmel being carried by people wearing the scapula. The scapula is a very recognisable sign in our iconography and spirituality. You'll find it in much of the order's art and devotional life. For example, this is again from that uh, museum that I mentioned at Darien in the States, this lovely uh, carving of Our Lady giving uh, the scapula to Simon Stock and saying, take this scapula. Now, if, the, if this scene never took place, if the scapular vision never took place, should we, um, well, what, what should we do with pictures like this? Should we just get rid of them, put them, um, I don't know, but, well, this one's in a museum, um, but how should we treat such images? Can we still value them for uh, those bigger truths that I've talked about? And I would say that the scapular devotion is still simple and effective. This is Father Malachi Lynch. He was uh, one of the instrumental figures in rebuilding Aylesford Priory, this historic uh, site of, of the order in su Southern England back in the 1940s and 50s. And he was a great promoter of the scapula. And he called it the use me today apostolate because he said, when people put on the scapula, it's an apron, it's a sign of service. So when we put it on, kiss the scapula, put it on and say, Mary, use me in the service of Jesus today. Use me today is the scapular prayer. And I think it's a very beautiful and very simple devotion. St. Simon Stock certainly continues to inspire. When Aylesford was reestablished, the Archbishop of Bordeaux brought over um, Simon Stock's skull from the shrine in the cathedral, and it's now in this beautiful reliquary at uh, Aylesford Priory. And there are relics of Simon Stock venerated still in Bordeaux at Aylesford in New York and other places. And he's one of the saints we can be sure is um, the relics we have are actually him because there's a, a continuous uh, story, a, a knowledge of where his remains have been, not so with all the saints. Now, I do have a pastoral concern when it comes to the abuse of the scapular devotion. I get quite annoyed when I see this style of scapula that says, whoever dies wearing the scapula shall not suffer eternal fire, Our Lady scapula promise. Because I don't believe there was such a scapula promise. So I don't like seeing it printed on a scapula as if it's some sort of guarantee. And some groups in the church persist in saying that the scapular vision and the Sabbatine privilege are absolutely true and in my mind they end up making the scapula into some sort of lucky charm, a, a superstition. If you, well I don't recommend you do it, but if, if you ever google the scapula um, you will find all kinds of very traditionalist groups who are opposed to the Second Vatican Council who say we need to go back to a time when everyone wore the scapula and we all had these traditional devotions and ignore what Pope Francis is saying about um, things like protection of the earth and social justice and, and so on. And I think those people have hijacked our Marian devotion. It, it's a devotion that spread beyond the order to the broader church but it originates with us, with Carmelites. And I think we have both a right and a responsibility to promote an authentic devotion that doesn't stray into this sort of legendary superstitious side, but promotes the, the Marian spirituality that is at the heart of our order. And this is encapsulated in, in all sorts of official documents of the order right up to the present day. This is the 1995 constitutions of the friars, as I said yesterday, we were awaiting the new ones. 
but the 1995 constitution say the scapula is a sign of Mary's permanent and constant motherly and sisterly love for her Carmelite brothers and sisters. By their devotion to the scapula, faithful to a tradition in the order dating back centuries, Carmelites express the loving closeness of Mary to the people of God. It's a sign of consecration to Mary, a means of uniting the faithful to the order and an effective and popular means of evangelization. And there are some other important modern documents you might like to look at. There's this catechesis and ritual published by the Carmelite family in North America in the year 2000. It's an excellent uh, summary of the scapular devotion. There's the letter that uh, Pope St. John Paul II wrote for the Carmelite Marian year in the year 2001, and a joint letter from the two generals of the order that same year. And also in 2001, the Vatican published a directory on popular piety and the liturgy, which talks about the scapula. Those documents, these modern documents, don't talk about a scapular vision or the Sabatine privilege. They focus on these symbolic values, a sign of closeness to God's, of Mary's closeness to God's people. The scapula is a sign of consecration to Mary, a sign of commitment to serve others, a sign of union with the Carmelite family, and a popular means of spreading the gospel. And we know that the scapular devotion has attracted thousands of people to the Carmelite family and its gospel values. Famous examples include St. John Paul II, we've got his scapula here, Oscar Romero, um, this, is his, this is a painting at the Carmelite Curia in Rome of him with his scapula, and blessed is Isidore Bacanja, the martyr of the scapula. So I'm going to close with some questions for your ongoing reflection. The scapular devotion has deep symbolic meaning. Is it worth promoting today if people don't understand the symbolism? Do people really know what the scapula is about? And can it be promoted without being superstitious or rooted in false history? Some people who do not feel called to the Carmelite religious life or third order secular are instead linked to Carmel through the scapula. Can this sense of connection be better promoted for the benefit of all? And lastly, if we say that the scapula is a sign of unity with the Carmelite family, can we build on this? Should we enroll people in our family and then never have any further contact with them? Ought we to develop modern scapular confraternities today? So I'm going to stop my screen share and I would be very interested to hear your thoughts and reactions. I hope that I haven't upset or offended anybody too much in this discussion of the scapula. I think it's a beautiful and wonderful thing, um, but we do need to think about how, uh, how we discuss it. Thank you very much, Dr. Johan. I think it's one of the best presentations I've ever heard on the scapula, a very touchy issue, of course, but you did a very wonderful job. Um, so just like last, uh, as yesterday, if you would like to ask a question, you can send it in the chat. You can try to raise your hand um, using the raise hand feature in Zoom. Bottom right, you will see something saying reactions. You touch on that and you'll see a little hand going up like that. Once you click on the hand, we will be able to see it. Or as I said, you can turn on your camera and just wave your hand like this in front of it and I'll be able to see you and give you the ability to speak. So we will take some questions now. Thank you. So I see Annette, I uh, can't see your full name, but I, but I recognize you. So Annette, you can unmute yourself. So at the bottom left, there's a little microphone. If you click on that, you'll hear you. I would just like to make a comment. Um, and that is whether or not the scapular legends are true or false, I don't think it would affect the relationship that we should have with the Carmelites. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Anyone else would like to ask a question or make a comment? As I said, you can just wave your hand in front of the camera. I'll see you if you can't use the chat or figure out how to do the raise hand feature.
I see Lost Peace, they're raising their hand. Okay. So Lost Peace, you can go ahead and unmute. So bottom left, you'll see a little microphone. If you click on that, we'll be able to hear you. Right. Hello. <laughs> I'm saying the fact that when a lady appeared, the last appearance of Fatima, she appeared as a lady. You know what I mean? As to the importance of Carmelite habits. Sorry, I, I missed. I heard Our Lady of Fatima and then I, I lost the rest of it. Yes, I said Our Lady was supposed to have appeared as Our Lady of um, Mount Carmel, Carmel. Mm -hmm. right? The last apparition at Fatima. Mm. So this is important to me. Mm. Thank you. So, yeah. so the fact that she was wearing the Carmelite habit. Absolutely, be. absolutely. And, and, and as well, um, in Lourdes, the, the last apparition was on the 16th of July, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, Mary seems to love, well, she loves the Carmelites and she loves uh, our habit. She loves our feast. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, these things all mesh together. And, and it's, a, it's a reminder to us that the scapula absolutely is very important. Um, it's 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 such a powerful symbol. We have a question from Carmel by the sea. So Carmel by the sea, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. If you can come a little closer to the microphone, we're just hearing you faintly. Okay, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I enjoyed the talk. What I was reflecting on is when the question came whether we should. Um, wear habits or not as a sign. And for me, I think, especially in this day and age where everything religious and everything to do with God is being pushed out of schools and um, cities and sidewalks and streets, every sign of God is being removed. I think it's important for us as religious, as priests, as lay people to be visible and present, especially by what we wear. It's true the habit does not make a person, but we need to be visible in the same way you would have plain clothes policemen and you would have uniform policemen. But when you see a policeman in his uniform, there is a certain expectancy as you would expect when you see a habit on a religious. And it reminds people that God is present, ever present with us and our blessed lady is here. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, it, um, I always think of an experience uh, of Father, Father Kevin, who I showed a picture of in his habit and out of his habit. Um, he has been a university chaplain and he finds that sometimes wearing his dog collar um, on the university campus is a very helpful thing. Some people will come over to speak to him because they see he's a priest and they want to talk about whatever it is they want to talk about. He said he's also seen people on the campus who see he's a priest and they turn around and walk the other way, <laughs> that they don't want to talk to a priest. So I suppose the challenge to us is, why do some people have such a negative, uh, not everybody, why do some people have such a negative image of priests, religious, and so on? Now, this may not be the case in the Caribbean, but here in, in England here and, and in Ireland and surrounding countries, we've had a, some terrible scandals, terrible abuse uh, carried out by a small number of priests and religious. And therefore, I think some people have said, well, for me, a religious habit is just a sign of, of, of abuse, of, of corruption, of hypocrisy. Now, we know that's not true of the vast majority of, of people, um, but for some people that is their experience. So I don't think, um, yeah, I think, I think we need to be visible. We need to, to show our faith in all sorts of different ways. It's just also being um, cunning enough to realize <laughs> That there are some people who are frightened or threatened or, or angered by by such things so it's how it's it's finding the appropriate way but certainly you know if i see someone in a in a habit or or, or 
religious garb. I always hope that, you know, if there's someone there that I'm going to resonate with, share something, uh, the most important thing in my life with. So probably we can take one more question before we have our break and get ready for the workshops. So is there another person that would like to ask a question? Again, you can just wave your hand in front of your screen or do the raise hand feature or send a message in the chat. So I see Sister Margarita Chan. So Sister Margarita, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll be able to hear you. Very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I appreciate your explanations and this scapula. Persons worried for good luck may do not quite understand what it symbolizes. Your explanations brought clarity. So I just want to thank you for this, okay? And I also for your overall talk, and I also enjoy the different images of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and your explanation of it, you know. So thank you very much for you, your sister. clarity in what you said to us today. God bless you. And thank continue you, your good work. Thank you. <laughs> Please pray for me. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that, uh, again, I don't know what the reality is in the Caribbean, but here in, in Britain, a lot of young people wear the rosary as a, as a fashion accessory. You know, they, 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 wear, they wear it around their neck, they wear it around their wrist. A lot of people wear crosses. Um, they still value something in it. Now, if you say to them, do you ever pray the rosary? They probably wouldn't know where to start, <laughs> some of them. But it's interesting that they still want um, that symbol. And it's an opportunity, I think, for us to say, you know, would you like me to teach you how to pray the rosary? Or would you like to talk a little bit about what, what this symbol means? Uh, I think we, we, sh we should always be on the lookout for opportunities to share the good news, to share the fact that there is a God and a God who loves us. And people are, I think, mostly d well disposed to that. They want to hear the good news. Um, and they, they're using symbols sometimes without even realizing it. Um, but yeah, I think those early images of, of, of uh, Carmelite icons are very beautiful, and I'm still exploring them myself. Um, and I would be very interested if, if there are statues of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in your different communities, your different homes that are a little bit different, that are somehow unique to your part of the world. I'd be really interested to see them because I, my hobby is collecting um, images of Carmelite saints and Carmelite iconography. So uh, I'd be really interested to see that. Dr. Johan, thank you once again. It was a brilliant presentation. And I'm sure if over the, the coming evening and night, if anybody thinks of any other questions, you can do so tomorrow, our final day with you. Or the time went too quickly. I wish we had a lot more time with you. <laughs> so have a wonderful I'll, um, I'll evening. just have to have to come to the Caribbean. <laughs> You're always welcome. <laughs> you have many homes to visit. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Very good. Well, Thank you, Dr. I look forward to being with you tomorrow, and, and tomorrow we will look at the, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. What, what are its origins, and, and what do the, the texts in the liturgy say to us? Thank you very much again.